so two years ago, um, June of two years ago, uh, Tony and I celebrated 30 years of marriage together. Yeah. And shortly thereafter, maybe about a month or so later, we um, began doing slow jams every night, 7 to midnight on KISS 104.1. So we've got this 30-year history together that we now curate on the air. And I think what's been really remarkable about that is the number of people since that time that have come to us and have said to us the words that we're talking about, the relationship that we're demonstrating, the things that we're doing, how much it's meant to them. And I've been kind of like questioning that, like, Lord, what does that all that mean? Well, since that time, God's really been moving on my heart and dealing with me as it relates to relationships. And if I never thought that it was God or that it was an important conversation for right now, this week sealed the deal for me. When I found and read this article that was in the Atlantic magazine online, I brought it so that you guys don't think that I'm lying when I tell you what the article is about. The article is entitled, How to Hire Fake Friends and Family. It's talking about a company in Japan that currently exists. In fact, I'm going to read you just two excerpts. This eight-year-old company, founded by this 36, 37-year-old man, provides professional actors to fill any role in the personal lives of clients with a burgeoning staff of 800 or so actors, ranging from infants to the elderly, the organization prides itself on being able to provide a surrogate for almost any conceivable situation. Wow. We're buying people now. Question from the reporter, when was your first success? Answer, I played a father for a 12-year-old with a single mother. The girl was bullied because she didn't have a dad, so the mother rented me. I've acted as the girl's father ever since. I am the only real father that she knows. Question, and this is ongoing? Answer, yes. I've been seeing her for eight years. She just graduated high school. Question, does she understand that you're not her real father? Answer, no. The mother hasn't told her. Question, how do you think she would feel if she discovered the truth? Answer, I think she would be shocked. You, you think? You, what? That was a revelation? You think? If the client never reveals the truth, I must continue the role indefinitely. If the daughter gets married, I have to act as a father in that wedding, and then I have to be the grandfather. So I always ask every client, are you prepared to sustain this lie? Wow. It's the most significant problem our company has. I submit that's not the most significant problem that his company has. But let me get to the point of what we're going to be talking about today. Another question. I understand that you work as a boyfriend, too. Come on, somebody. Can you describe that experience? Well, those clients are usually older ladies. <laughs> Coo cougars? And, okay. But it's, it used to be primarily women in their 50s, but now there are even more women in their 30s. Is this sexual or just platonic question? Answer, it's a dating situation. You know, situation ship. Y'all know about that. Okay, it's not about having sexual relations, although some women have expected that. I thought there was a word for when you have to pay. Okay, but you know, we're talking about a business, right? Generally, the women just want to have fun with a younger man. They want to feel young again. Question of today, why do you think these women hire you? The women typically say that in a real relationship, you're slowly building trust. It takes years to create a strong connection. For them, it's a lot of hassle and disappointment. Imagine investing five years with someone and then they break up with you. It's just easier to schedule two hours per week to interact with an ideal boyfriend. 
There's no conflict, no jealousy, no bad habits. I just felt that somebody said that might be a good idea. <laughs> Everything is perfect and you've been on so many fake dates. What's it like for you in your own personal life to go on an actual date? I don't have a real girlfriend right now. Real dating feels like work. It feels like work to care for a real person. Many women say, I want to marry you. I say, you're in love with an order form. Wow. Wow. It's not me. It's the acting that you love. Pick up your faces. <laughs> this is where we are in 2017. We'd rather rent him than work for him. We'd rather pay for her than invest ourselves in her. And that brings us to our conversation today, which I'm really excited to, to, to share with you, but after the first service when my husband said it was a tough message, I knew we was in trouble. Because the truth is tough. So I'm going to talk to us very carefully and very clearly about seven key characteristics that I believe all people need to have in successful relationships using Ruth's story. God began to deal with me this summer about a list. Y'all know the list that y'all have. He got to be chocolate. <laughs> He's got to be vanilla or a combination thereof. He got to have that good hair. He's got to have that right body. She's got to make sure that, that hair is popping and flowing, them lips popping and those eyebrows done and the toes done. You know the list that we have when we're looking for the special someone. Who would be bold enough to declare to me today that you have had or still have a list? Y'all up in church. Y'all are in church. Church. Church people. Every human being has a list, right? What I'm going to be sharing with you today are seven key characteristics. After the 30 year anniversary that Tony and I celebrated and after now walking into two years of talking about relationships every single evening, I realized that there's some transcendent qualities that both men and women need to have. And in Ruth's story, we see these seven characteristics. Stay with me, work with me, and I promise you at the end, God will meet you where you are in your relationship, whether married or single. And in fact, with this message, I didn't get any sleep last night because I was praying pretty much the entire evening referencing married people. I know that when we start talking about lists and we start talking about finding that someone, we kind, of, we kind of just think that that's all for singles. It is for singles, but it's most importantly these questions and these answers and these characteristics are for those who are married as well. So let's begin in Ruth's story. Starting with Ruth chapter two, verses one through four. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth. You want to underline that. A man of great wealth. Of the family of Elimelech, his name was Boaz. So Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, please let me go to the field. Underline those words. Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I might find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz underline that please and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz who was of the family of Elimelech now behold Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers actually his reapers the Lord be with you and they answered him the Lord bless you the first characteristic that I see and this simple exchange starts with an A, and it's called ambition. Both men and women need to have ambition. Now, before you sit there and say, she just talking about being a gold digger because she had us underline a man of great wealth, and now she going to talk about getting that grind and that hustle on because he got to have some money. That is not what I'm talking about. I am talking about ambition. I am talking about 
purpose. I am talking about a work ethic, a grind, a hustle, the ability to be able to get up even when the chips are down and move forward strategically toward a goal and, a, and an objective. If you are with someone who is not ambitious, you will be carrying them for the rest of your life. A man is heavy on your back with no ambition. A woman is heavy on your back with no ambition. We see in the scriptures that Boaz was a man of great wealth. You don't get wealthy being a slacker. You don't get wealthy without having some kind of purpose and drive and ambition to get you there. But I see that same ambition in Ruth as well. Ruth and Naomi were busted and broke and had nothing. Can anybody relate to being broke, busted, and having nothing? You can. Thank you in the back. Ruth was this woman, and she did not sit in her home and hope for a man. I'm going to go over here because those people over there are mean. She was not saying, oh, woe is me. I don't have any money. God, just please send me someone to rescue me. She said, please let me get up out of here and go glean in a field. Let me go to work. That is a work ethic that any man can use because ironically, Boaz in his state, being a great man in his social circles, Ruth being poor and a foreigner, there's no way that those two paths would have ever met but Jesus. There's an intersection called but Jesus that we can all participate in if we have ambition. Many women aren't being, they're not being found because they're not in position of working to be found. And men aren't looking. You can have your cake and eat it too today. You have your choice of four, five, or six, so why do I have to look? They can find me. That's completely twisted. When you are a person of purpose, when you are a person of ambition, when as a Christian you do what your father did, Genesis 1-1 starts with God's ambition. He spoke light into existence. He began to move and shape and create everything that we see. We are from an ambitious God. We've got to become ambitious people. In relationships, when you hit the rough spots, and you will hit them. It will be your drive. It will be your purpose. It will be your ambition that moves you forward together. Both him and her must be ambitious. So for this message, we're going to do a rating system because y'all like to leave those ratings on Google. Oh, I'm going to get them. That service was just a two-star and I'm going to tell them about themselves. Well, you're going to get a chance to tell yourself about yourself because today you're going to rate yourself and if you are married, your partner on each quality. So think about your ambition. Think about your hustle. Think about your grind. Think about how you can get things done in your life and give yourself one to five stars. Then think about the Mr. or the Mrs. that you are with and or if you are dating the Mr. or the Mrs. that you are dating. But if you are not dating and want to be, you will have to revisit this list once you find Boo and find out whether or not he or she is ambitious. We good? Number two, let's move on. So what happens after uh, Ruth goes out and says, oh, I got to get some work on right here. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, so he had a manager in charge of reapers, who this? Who this? Who, wait, whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, it is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Underline whose young woman is this? Because the second 
characteristic that men and women must have in successful relationships is interest. You must be interested in said person. Boaz noticed Ruth and asked about her. I am constantly talked to from women's perspective. I don't know if he likes me. I don't know, how come he didn't text me back? How come? Because he ain't interested. Would you please preach that? Stand up and preach that. But we don't want to hear that, right? When a man is interested, who this? And can bro any brothers in the house, when you were interested, did you not say who this? And if you're not saying that, who this, you don't want to know who this is. Same way with the women. Because don't get it twisted. Brothers in a minute will be like, mm, I wonder if she liking me. I wonder, I wonder. Don't wonder. Be interested. Our attraction leads us to people. Our attraction, our interest is needed. If you are married, and you are no longer interested in your spouse, you have taken one step toward disaster. Interest is absolutely vital. What's the takeaway? If you're single and you're interested and they are not married, not attached to anyone else, ask who it is. If they are married or attached to someone else, keep moving. I'm straight, straight. Don't even look that way because your attention will, how do I want to put this? What you attend to will turn on that switch of attraction. Hear me. How many of you have ever seen the other person that the person cheated with and said, what? <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever said, what? It's because our attraction, our attention, what we're giving to that individual will make anything look good. So your interest must be focused. If they are unattached, you can ask who this. If they are attached, you keep moving. If you are married, you better be asking who this every day. Who are you today? I'm interested in you. Oh, what you wearing? Oh, you smell good. How you did that dinner? Oh, I am noticing you. I am attracted. Is this as practical as it can be? Because here's what happens in relationships. We start attending to other people, places, and things, and the marriage and the relationship go by the wayside. I don't care if you've been married 30 seconds, or in our case, 31 years. Every day I gotta say, who it is? Amen. Who it is? Rate yourself. Are you interested? Be honest, married folk. Rate your partner. Is he or she still interested? Be honest. If you are single, rate yourself in being interesting. I didn't say this in the first service. I got I to gotta talk about this for a minute, especially to my, to my women. We are standing ovation for Deja. She got it going on. Gifts, talents, boom, popping, making it happen. That's what I'm talking about. She's an interesting woman. What she does not need is a fool trying to steal or pull down her shine. Interesting people create the atmosphere for people to be interested in them. If you are married and your spouse ain't interested no more, it could be you are no longer interesting. Are you sure I can? I might need to sit down myself in a minute because y'all looking at me mean. Single women, be interesting. Be about point number one, your purpose. Be about that grind, about that hustle, what God's created you to do, and do it. You can't just having to applaud a young woman. That's talking, that's grind on steroids right there. Use that as inspiration to be 
about something so that you can attract his or her interests. Because your biceps gonna get flabby one day. Oh Lord, let me stop. Too much, too much. Next, next. Let's go. Then Boaz says to Ruth, okay, so where do we leave him off? Boaz, okay, she's been, okay, she, Boaz got the 411. He's interested, right? Now let's go to the next one. Then Boaz said to Ruth, you listen, my daughter, will you not? Oh, now he all up in her personal space, okay. Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? Underline that. And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. History very quickly. They are about, Ruth and Naomi come into Bethlehem about three months. This is about a three month period where we pick up this story. They're broke, busted, disgusted. Ruth has to go out and begin to get food. Well, the law, God's law, had already been established. And part of that law was that if you are a landowner and you had crops, you were to leave the corners and anything that falls, leave it on the ground. And then people gleaning, reaping after you, after that process has happened, can pick it up and can eat. Ruth is there gleaning. She's there picking up the scraps that they drop. She's at the corners of the field. And Boaz is saying to her, I need you to stay in my wheelhouse. I need you to stay in my corporation. I need you to stay here where I am because I have commanded my young men not to touch you. Now, why did he say that? Because a lot of touching was happening. Young women who are poor, they were prey. Does that sound familiar today and age? They were prey. The young men, she's poor. She has nothing to offer and she's a woman. I can do what I want to do with her. Boaz had this quality which is absolutely essential in relationships. Starting with an E, he had empathy. He could walk in her shoes. He was not so high and mighty with his great wealth self that he did not recognize this is a young woman, she's a foreigner, and men will approach her. Men will molest her is actually what the translation there means. I've commanded my young men, they better not touch you, baby. They better not touch you. What does that mean for us in relationships? You want a person who can walk in your shoes. You want a man that can feel what you're feeling, sense what you're sensing, be with you where you are, not trying to make you be where he is. You want a woman that can understand your hustle, understand your grind, understand your ambition. There would be no reason for a help mate if you ain't doing nothing. We want to preach all day long that women are a helpmate. What I'm helping? What, what, what am I helping, boo-boo? There's only so much help. I mean, these children are in my mouth. I can't say the kind of words I want to say. But there's only so much helping you can do in the bedroom. Right? We've got to be about something together. I need to be able to feel you in that arena and other arenas. What happens in relationships when there is no empathy, selfishness takes over. And then it's about me and it's about you, not about us, not about what each other might need, feel, or want. We then begin to take each other for granted and drift away. I have given you the recipe right there for stopping divorce in your relationship. Feel what she's felt. When's the last time you felt what he's felt? When's the last time you actually walked in her shoes? What is it like to be married to you? What is it like? You shaking your head because God knows it takes a lot. I know it does, boo-boo. You don't have to shake. Tony's got this stare. He ain't not trying to give me no information whatsoever because I don't want to be in trouble. He don't want to be in trouble. So we try to just do it the right way. But what is it like to be married to you? 
We have to be in each other's shoes. If you are dating someone and it's all about her, keep moving. If you're dating someone and it's all about him, keep moving. You want to see this quality. Rate yourself. How empathetic are you? How much are you able to walk in someone else's shoes? Keith preached his heart out here for the month of October. And at the bottom line, if we can't walk in each other's shoes, we will never see reconciliation. Walk in my shoes. It's the exact same principle. I want to feel what Tony's feeling. I want him to know what I'm feeling and sensing and walk that way with each other. How you doing? Anybody got them five stars going all over? Oh, okay. Well, Y'all want to come up here and preach it then? I mean, you know. Okay. <laughs> Let's go on. So we see this empathy, right? <clears throat> I know what you need, Ruth, and I got you. I love that about Boaz. Boaz called her his daughter. Y'all do realize that the research does say that Boaz is an older man. He ain't some young, hot, popping, some hottie, hottie toddy. He's an old man, closer to Naomi's age than Ruth's age. So I'm going to need you to set your mind straight because in the church we have just done a number on this Ruth and Boaz thing. And if your daughter brought home a 60-year-old man... Why are you shaking your head over there? Why are you shaking your head? Deja can't bring home no 60-year-old man? Well, okay. Get, get it right. This is Boaz, though. We want her to have a Boaz, do we? Really? Well, okay. Let me keep going. I got... What happened to me? This... Ooh, okay. Next. Next. What did she say? He said, stay here, girl. I got you. Next. What was her response to that? Oh, you better go, Poppy. No, she said she fell on her face, bowed to the ground, and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? And Boaz answered, Please circle the word answered. And brothers, please star that word answered. He has an answer. And he said to her, it has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. This brother had a full dossier on her. It wasn't just who this. He done gone in. He done found history, family history, her relationship status. He knew everything about her because the next characteristic, L, he learned about her. You want a man or a woman who makes you their learning project. Question, married people. What have you learned new about your spouse today? Oh, if y'all could just see what I see up here. Ooh, this is the time I wish I had them little secret cam, the little kiss cam. Because the word, ooh, first service, woo, you could cut it with a knife when I ask that question. What is the new information that you have learned about your spouse this week? What new do you know this month? I have been married longer than I have been single. Three decades with one man and I'm still learning. Why? Because Tony is still growing. Your spouse can't learn if you the same way that you was back in 1964. They nothing changed. 
we got to do it the same way over and over and over again. We got to think the same way. We got to live in the same place. It's got to be the same all the time. Nothing new. You ain't got no new conversation, no new thought, no new ideas. If you are dating someone and y'all can't have but the same conversation over and over and over again, you're setting yourself up for the most boring marriage and relationship ever. That's why people leave. We are creatures created by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You're going to tell me that God ain't got no new conversation? That he's not growing? That he's not expanding and trying to expand us? What do we... I can remember being married I don't, when we were in Miami, so what was that, about eight, nine, ten, I don't even remember what the year was. But remember when that salesperson stopped us in the, in the elevator, and we were doing what we do, we talked. And she said, dang, y'all been married for so long and you can still talk to each other? I was like, what? What? What are you? She was amazed that we still had conversation. How many of you have gone out to a restaurant, looked over, you shaking your head. You could tell that couple, can't you? Tell me what they look like. <laughs> Looking at their phones. Stay, they, un, un, thank you. Uninterested. Not even interested in the pancakes they're about to eat. They're just dead. I don't want that. Because here's the deal. Our children are watching. I spend a great deal of my time with young women in high school, in college, young professional women. And the idea of marriage and children is dead. Because all they've seen is dead relationships trying to survive got to get to this point where we are committed to growing and learning about one another. Amen. Rate yourself. How many stars you get for the learning? And how many stars do you give your partner for learning you? It's going to be all right, people. I promise. I promise. It's going to be okay. Next. What happens now? Oh. Let's listen to Boaz's response. He's still talking. I don't know. I know all about you, girl. I know your mama, your daddy, the people you came from. You left your father. You ain't got no husband. You got a mom in law. I know you, girl. Next, he says, The Lord repay your work. Underline the Lord. And a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel. Underline that again. Under whose wings you have come for refuge. It is so amazing to me that Boaz did not take credit for her situation. He went directly to God. He knew that she was being set up, protected by God. He had a belief system that was beyond what we could see or hear right now. He then goes on to say, then she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. She's recognizing that his words are comforting, they're kind, he's giving credit and honor to God. The point here is your beliefs and your values must be in line with each other. You've got to have the same beliefs. You cannot date somebody who thinks abortion is okay if you think life is okay. You cannot be with somebody who has a different ideology about raising children. They can just believe whatever they want if your ideology is they've got to be grown up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You've got to be on the same page as far as values are concerned around money, around sex, around communication. The belief system and the belief structure of your relationship is what builds the house. You can't be with someone who doesn't believe like you believe. Hear me. I am not saying agree with you. Yeah. I'm not saying think the same way about everything. But those core yeah. beliefs and those core values have got to be the same. Right. If he's in church because your mama said he needs to come to church, that does not make him a Christian. Yeah. 
If you are thinking, oh, she'll get saved. She'll come to church. It'll rub off on her. No, it won't, boo-boo. Just like work ethic don't run off, neither do beliefs. You can't wish somebody into a groove and a work ethic that is excellent. You can't have someone who does not believe in going to work all of a sudden because you get married start working. Nor can you have someone who does not believe in something that you fundamentally believe in have them flip the script just because you're in a relationship or get married. You've got to be looking for these attributes and qualities before you give your heart to someone. Rate yourself. Do you believe what your partner believes? Do you believe what you want your partner to believe? And does he or she believe what you believe? Are you on the same page as far as core values are concerned? Why is this important? Because what I have seen in my 53 years of being on this planet is that it's not that we don't have enough money. It's not that we aren't educated enough. It's not about our color. It's not about our ideology. Nine times out of 10, the failures in our lives come from the people that we choose to love. I have seen too many men start off and then that one, that one woman derails them. I've seen too many young women start off, they've got it, and one good smelling boo-boo. <laughs> and it's done, it's done. Our decision and who we love is absolutely paramount. And we've got to be on the same page with these foundational characteristics. Let's go on. Now Boaz, oh, now he, Bo Boaz is just moving somebody, ain't he? Ruth, chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, I'm wondering what Ruth is thinking about this time. Hey, you know, it's not on scripture, so I can only do conjecture, so I won't. Boaz said to her at mealtime, come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parched grain to her and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. Underline that. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. Also, let grain from the bundles fall purposefully for her. Leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. That's about four gallons of food that Ruth was able to get because you see Boaz took it up a couple notches. This next characteristic is foundational. S, they must be supportive. They must be. What we see is Boaz saying, come on over here, girl, get some food. Eat, dip, make sure you're full. And we also see Ruth, after she's satisfied, doing what? Holding some back for Naomi. She's supporting Naomi, Boaz is supporting her. In a solid healthy, vibrant relationship, you see support one to the other. You see something that is there, he is supporting her, she is supporting him, no matter what, regardless. It still brings me to tears when I think about the fact that every engagement that I can do, every engagement that Tony can be at, two services, no matter what, he is in the front row. He is my number one cheerleader. And I cannot tell you how many times I've quit at the kitchen table with him telling me about 
your purpose. Keep going. You can't quit now. I don't care if you're not making any money. I don't care if they don't know your name. You've been called to do this. Do you know what I can do with that kind of support? The same thing that you can do in your relationship when you look at your boo and you say no matter what, no matter what they say, no matter what they do, no matter what is not happening or is happening for you, I got you. That's what Boaz was saying to her. That's what she was saying to Naomi. I'm not going to leave you old lady. I got you. We want that. I look in your eyes now and I can see you want that. You want that support. And Jesus can give us all the support that we need. But Jesus cannot come down here and make our husband or our wife support us. We've got to do that for ourselves. Rate yourself. How supportive are you? And how supportive is your spouse? Yes, tighten right up in here. And finally, Ruth 2, 18 through 23. Then she took it up, all this food. <laughs> she went into the city, and her mother-in-law lost her mind, saw what she had gleaned. So she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. She's like, first, go on and eat. Go on and eat, lady. I got you. And her mother-in-law said to her, where have you gleaned today? Where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. She instantly knew that there had been a shift happening in their home. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work, you know, his name is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, blessed be the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. Oh, she's coming alive now. And Naomi said to her, this man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. Ruth the Moabitess said, he also said to me, you should shall stay close by my young men until I have finished all my harvest. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. Boaz gave her his word. She in turn said to Naomi, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go and glean daily. The final attribute is trustworthiness. I've got to be able to trust your word. I've got to be able to believe what you are telling me. If you are late for dinner, I've got to believe you when you said you had to just stop to get some gas, not stop to see someone else. If he asks you how much you spent, <laughs> Not, you know, uh, about, about 1,500? How many of you have ever been lied to in a relationship? Give me some words of how that felt. Horrible. Terrible. And once trust is broken, talk to me. What happens? It's hard to get it back. Thank you for saying that. Boaz said, you stick with me. I got you. And we'll find out next week whether or not he told the truth. Ruth said, he told me to come and glean every single day. And the Bible says that she did it. Naomi didn't have to worry about it. And I need you to know that this whole season of this courtship, about, I don't know, about seven weeks, about 50 days, 50 or 60 days, because that's what it took to get the harvest from start to finish. When you think about it, let's finish the, our, 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 our little puzzle here. At the beginning, at the front page, you have all, oh, you, you, why, why are you all ahead of me, girl? You're already ahead of me. <laughs> I want you to write down the words. So the A goes in space number two at the top of your outline. The I goes in space number five. All you guys. Space number three is E. Space number four is L. Space number one is B. 
Space number six is S and space number seven is T. What you have, ladies and gentlemen, is your bay list. <laughs> I was really, really, I was just having a ball doing this part. Searching up the urban dictionary for the word bay. What does bay mean? Because God knows I've only got one daughter who's left with, who's not booed up. Every day, I gotta get ready for bay, bay, gotta see me, bay, bay. What is this bay? Who is this bay, right? So it is a colloquialism, you know, boo-boo, sweet thing, honey chops, whatever you want to call them. The word now is bay. I love the fact, though, that bay is an acronym that means before any, before anyone else. When I say that Tony is Bay, I'm saying that he is before anyone else. When you say that your wife is Bay, she is before anyone else. When you're looking for Bay, you're looking for that person who qualifies to be before anyone else. Amen. Amen. Beliefs that are like yours. Ambition driven by purpose. Empathy able to walk in someone else's shoes learns about you, is interested in you, supports you, and you can trust. Those seven pillars will begin to build a relationship house that can't be broken. If you're single, thank you. If you're single, I'm going to start with you. If you're single and want bae, one day. Will you stand to your feet so I can pray for you? Uh -oh. Amen. This is the part in the other service where I just, you know, just take a little glance, a glance, glance around, you know, you know. Because here's what's interesting. Ruth, jo I know y'all better, uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> Married folk trying to no no you can't get in this this is for this is for single bays I'm sorry the Bible says that Ruth happened happened to come to the portion of the field that belonged to Boaz there's a happening that needs to happen for you there's a happenstance that can be a part of your future. I am not of the traditional values that there's only one man for one woman. The math never works. That doesn't work out for me. But I do believe that God sets up circumstances. That's right. That you can be about your business on purpose, serving him, being all that God has created for you to be. And they just might notice Amen. with the same beliefs, with the ambition, with the empathy, learning about you, interested in you, supporting you, and being trustworthy. This is not just for women. If there's a man out there, because I sure had some man standing up in the first service that said, I'm looking for Bay too. If you're a man and you'd like to get in. Yeah, you better stand, brother. You better, that's what I'm talking about. You cannot, that's right, that's right. Because we need to have opposite sex bays. Yes. Hey, wow. <laughs> Father, I thank you. I thank you for all the single people that are standing. Lord, I am believing with them that as they cultivate these characteristics, knowing their beliefs, honing their ambition and purpose, being empathetic, learning about themselves, being interested in themselves first, supporting and being trustworthy. Lord, I thank you that as they make you bay first that you will set up 
the happenstances, the circumstances, the situations that bring them into the intersection of finding those that they can be bays with for the rest of their lives. Father, I thank you for blowing a fresh wind in our minds about what it takes to be a relationship worthy individual. And I thank you that even this week that there's a new walk and talk and anointing and purpose in my single brothers and sisters lives in Jesus name. Have a seat single folks. Tony. Married people stand up in the house because I got to pray for you too. Even if Bay is not here, yes, you need to stand up. Because here's the deal. If you think that you can do three decades with someone and stay the same, child, let me pray for you right now. Retool your beliefs and your value system together. Revisit your ambition. What we are about, Tony and I are having real deep conversations now about the next 5, 10, and 15 years. We're still retooling. Okay. Empathize. Get the shoes out. Man, I want to see you put them stilettos on <laughs> and figure out what that feels like to have to be cute for you every single day. Learn your spouse. Be interested in your spouse. Support your spouse and be trustworthy. Please. Your children are watching. Others' children are watching. The world is watching us, church. Can we please lead in this area? As Tony prays for us. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for... All the married folks here, Father, I, I, I thank you that we will be bay for one another with you first and then that spouse before anyone and anything else. Father, I thank you that your word came uh, from Jennifer and I, like I said after the first service, it's hard because it's hard to hear where we are and where we need to go to be lined up with where you want us to be. But I thank you for giving us the instruction of here's where you need to go. I thank you for each and every married couple here. I thank you, Father, that this word will renew them, strengthen them, and push them to where you want them to be, constantly growing, constantly loving, trusting, and being close to one another. I thank you, Father, for the married couples here. And as Jennifer prayed for the singles, for the singles as well. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be good bays this week. And singles, when you find bay, y'all know you better invite me to the wedding. I need to know what's up up in here. Have a great week, guys. God bless you.